Good afternoon. I'm the City of Waco Mayor Dylan Meek, here with a group of local government and healthcare experts to provide an update on the latest COVID-19 information in Waco and McLennan County. Today's press conference is being conducted virtually and broadcast on the Waco City Cable Channel, our live stream online at wccc.tv, and on the City of Waco Public Information Facebook page. A full Spanish version of this press conference will air on the Waco City Council cable channel and our live stream today at 4 30 p.m. Mayor Pro Tem Sabido, will you please provide those details to our Spanish speaking audience? Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Para ayudar a nuestros ciudadanos que hablan español a saber lo que se dice durante esta conferencia de prensa, un traductor está grabando una traducción en español en vivo durante esta conferencia de prensa. Esta grabación completa en español reemplazará el sonido del inglés en el video y una versión en español de toda la conferencia de prensa se reproducirá en el canal de cable de la ciudad de Hueco aproximadamente a las 4.30 de esta tarde. Puede ver la conferencia de prensa en el canal 10 o por internet en vivo en wccc.tv. Mayor, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Hector. Joining me today virtually to speak to current issues and updates are McLennan County Judge Scott Felton, Dr. Jackson Griggs, CEO of Waco Family Medicine, Dr. Brian Becker, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer with Ascension Providence Healthcare Alliance, Dr. Umad Ahmad, Interim Chief Medical Officer with Baylor Scott and White Hillcrest. And also online today are Lashonda Mowry Horn, the Director of the Waco McLennan County Public Health District and Dr. Farley Verner, our health authority for the Waco McLennan County Public Health District. Thank you so much everyone for being available online today with us um, to provide important COVID-19 updates to our community. Um, and I know that right before this conference, we talked about a potentially different order, but Judge Felton, would you mind uh, kicking us off with an update? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, there continues to be uh, really good news around the COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, in our community. In the past week, the CDC and the FDA announced that the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine had completed its safety reviews and the advisory committee did not recommend any restrictions uh, on the use of the vaccine. On Friday uh, last week, the Texas Department of State uh, Health Services notified all COVID-19 vaccine providers in Texas that they should resume administering the J&J &J vaccine. That is very good news for our community. It gives us another, uh, another option for our communities to, uh, uh, to choose a vaccine that they would want to take. Uh, if you have any questions about this vaccine, please start with your personal physicians. Uh, and work together to determine the best vaccine option for you. Beginning next week, the Waco McLennan County Public Health Department uh, will resume offering the vaccine. The health district is working with local businesses and nonprofit groups to schedule more clinics. According to, uh, uh, there will be uh, uh, additional mobile clinics will be provided in the area. The first mobile clinic will be held at the Meals on Wheels a, a few weeks. There was one held a few weeks ago. The health district uh, has also been administering vaccines to the Salvation Army staff. Another mobile clinic uh, scheduled for this Saturday at 9 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. at the Second Missionary Baptist Church. There will also be a mobile clinic in Waco Housing Authority on May 15th and a public clinic at the upcoming Juneteenth celebration. According to the Texas Department of State Health Services dashboard, uh, as of yesterday afternoon, 32.86% of the people uh, 16 and older in Texas have been vaccinated. In McLennan County, 36.56 have received at least one dose and 27 0.45% uh, have been fully vaccinated. Uh, I cannot encourage uh, our community enough uh, that the uh, COVID vaccine is the best tool to protect yourself from COVID-19, as well as your family and your community. Vaccination registration uh, now live on the COVID Waco website. This, uh, there is no more 
uh, wait list for the McLennan County Public Health District Vaccine Hub. Uh, you can visit covidwaco.com or call 254-750-1890 and be registered for an appointment as soon as tomorrow. Clinic dates are currently offered Tuesday through Saturday. Clinic days may uh, change depending upon demand. And finally, the Waco McKinney County Public Health District recently, recently launched a vaccine ambassador program. This program is volunteer based and rooted in uh, a mission to engage and empower our community members uh, to uh, share accurate, up to date COVID 19 information from vetted. Uh, Credible resources. Answer frequently asked questions about COVID-19 vaccines, assist others in vaccine, uh, vaccination registration and scheduling processes, navigate local systems to locate COVID-19 vaccine availability and appointments, encourage our community to receive a COVID-19 vaccine and to continue practicing COVID-19 prevention measures. Uh, those who are 18 years or older who are able to pass the City of Waco's background check and who want to serve our community in this way are encouraged to apply. For more information, contact vaccine reps at wacotexas.com. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Judge Felton. Uh, Dr. Griggs, will you please share the current COVID-19 data for Waco and McLennan County? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and first, let me thank uh, Judge Felton for uh, those important comments, particularly as they pertain to uh, vaccinations. I'll, I'll touch on vaccines here in just a minute as well. I'm going to just jump right in and share uh, my screen here. Um, and uh, and and while the, the World Health Organization reported that the world has reached a record 5.7 million global new cases in a single week. The new case counts in the United States, Texas, and McLennan County continue to be um, at a steady state, with McLennan County being proportionally lower in incidence than both Texas and the United States. Let's go and advance my slides here. Um, You'll see here that there's still community spread, but the relatively low uh, rate of transmission has held steady for eight wonderful weeks. And the positivity rate has gradually decreased. And while we still need to see modestly more testing, uh, given the amount of virus that still exists in the community, the positivity rate of 4% indicates we can continue to mitigate the spread of the virus with contact tracing, quarantine, and isolation, which remain very important uh, strategies for keeping the virus under control. And this is a slide that I have uh, I've shared from the health district, and it represents the number of hospital patients admitted uh, for, uh, for COVID-19, and as expected, we've seen a steady decrease in hospitalization and there are uh, correspondingly no challenges to hospital capacity due to COVID-19 um, right now. Globally, mortality has increased for six consecutive weeks, but the local death rate has steadily de decreased since peaks midwinter. And uh, saying that, as, as long as uh, there is spread of the virus in our community, we will continue to see neighbors perish from this disease. So uh, while these numbers are, are, uh, are so promising uh, for the future, we, we must stay uh, vigilant. And, um, and, and a question that came uh, from, uh, from one of the members of the press um, that I wanted to answer, uh, could the end of the mask order combined with spring break travel have caused another surge in cases? So kind of a, uh, a hypothetical question, could it have happened? And uh, and so why didn't it? I mean, yes, we were all worried that it was, uh, that there was a, a, 
uh, relatively substantial risk that we were going to see um, another bump in cases uh, following the repeal of the mask masking mandate from the governor and with spring break. Um, uh, wh why didn't we see that? Um, well, uh, it is because of uh, the, um, the, the willingness of our community uh, to, uh, to come in and get vaccinated, the, uh, the linkages between public health and health care in our community to, uh, to maximize the availability of vaccinations in our community. To date, the number of doses in the county, uh, 130,639 um, was, uh, was the count that was provided to me by the health district. The number of people fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated. So the first number is doses, fully vaccinated individuals, 52,357. So, um, so I would say, why didn't, uh, why didn't that surge occur? Because of the number of vaccinated individuals in our community. Um, to some extent, natural immunity has also been a protective um, factor here, but I would just mention that there is evidence the immunity from infection does fade over time and may not be as protective as immunity through vaccination, which is why we encourage individuals, even if they've been, even if they have had COVID-19 diagnosed, uh, that they still uh, come in and get vaccinated. And while 100% uh, of vaccination within our community is, is not an achievable goal, um, if if we can build a wall around uh, vulnerable individuals who may not be vaccinated, we can build a wall through immunized individuals, then we can protect our neighbors who, uh, who might be at risk for, for death from, from this virus. And, uh, and this graph I think shows uh, w one more image of the success story. Um, in our vaccination efforts. Uh, you, you do see the last two weeks, there has been a drop in vaccination rates. Um, and I think that this highlights how all of us have a continuing responsibility to encourage all of our friends and family who are not yet vaccinated to get an appointment. Um, I think it also highlights the tremendous value in the health district's efforts in the vaccine ambassador program. So if you have an inkling, please reach out to the health district uh, and become an ambassador. If, if a formal program doesn't appeal to you though, you can still be a massive um, influence for good in, in your community by, by just uh, suggesting um, uh, your friends and family get a vaccine. Pretty much everywhere I go these days, I'm I'm asking uh, folks, have you been vaccinated yet? And, and encouraging those uh, who say, oh, I'm not, I'm not quite ready, or I'm just not sure. Um, I try to remind them that uh, you know we've had many, many months now of vaccination efforts since December, and we uh, and we have seen the case rates drop, fatality drop, and we have seen so, so, so rare uh, of a serious adverse effect to the vaccine. Um, that, uh, that the evidence is, is abundantly clear that uh, vaccine is our way uh, forward. It's our pathway out of this pandemic. And so kind of in that same vein, uh, I wanted to just uh, share some, some facts about the Johnson Johnson vaccine just to keep that concern in proper perspective. Um, so case fatality rates uh, for COVID-19, about 1%, which means one in a hundred diagnosed with COVID-19 die from the disease. One in 22,000, and this, I, I don't know, this was um, well known uh, before uh, the conversations about cerebral vein thrombosis, but one in 22,000 people diagnosed with COVID-19 will actually have a cerebral vein thrombosis. So that this, this blood clot in the brain that, um, that's created concern around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, actually the risk exists when you get uh, uh, COVID-19, and the risk is far greater um, uh, of that blood clot in the brain if you get COVID-19 than it is with the Johnson and, and Johnson vaccine. In fact, 23 times 
um, a greater likelihood to get cerebral vein thrombosis from COVID-19 than from the Johnson and Johnson uh, vaccine, which is which is very effective at preventing COVID-19. So only about a one in 500,000 uh, chance of having cerebral vein thrombosis. And that's when you look across the, the board at, um, at, uh, at all of those who have received vaccine and those very few instances, uh, 15 out of 8 million, um, where there have been cerebral vein thrombosis. Only three of those 15 um, died from that complication. And when you look at specific subgroups for women uh, less than 50 years old, the, there's a slightly higher um, risk than those who are over 50 years old. For those over 50 years old who are vaccinated with Johnson & Johnson, there's less than a one in a million uh, chance of having cerebral vein thrombosis. So um, I like the way the CDC uh, put it. Women younger than 50 years old should be aware of the rare but increased risk of this adverse event and that there are other COVID-19 vaccine options available uh, for which this risk has not been seen. And, and that was uh, uh, updated on the CDC website uh, on, April, on April 25th. So here's the, the take home points. The no local news is resoundingly good. We have a manageable number of cases, hospital and death remain low, and our vaccine supply is strong. Uh, the world news remains concerning. Americans number, America's numbers are improving due to vaccine access, while several countries lacking access are seeing record-breaking incidents and uh, um, the, uh, the bulk of the virus worldwide does create new risk for variants. Um, and, um, and our hope is, is that vaccine can be distributed globally in order to reduce the impact of the, uh, of the continuing spread of the virus so that the risk of new variant emergence uh, lowers um, correspondingly. And again, vaccines are the pathway out of this difficult era. There are risks and benefits with every treatment in medicine. Um, uh, and, and the calculation is, how big is the benefit and how small is, is the risk or how sizable is the risk and how small is the benefit? And, and in this case, um, you know, the whole house of medicine, which is a diverse group of, uh, of individuals and physicians, but there is a resoundingly positive response that vaccines, the, the benefit of vaccines far outweigh the risk and the, the, the very strong recommendation uh, is that all individuals in the community um, get vaccinated for COVID-19. And that, that uh, concludes my report. So I'm gonna stop my screen share. Thank you, Dr. Griggs. I uh, appreciate that report. Uh, Dr. Becker, do you have an update for us as well? I do. Um, good afternoon, I'm, I'm Dr. Brian Becker. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Operating Officer at Ascension Providence. And thank you, Mayor Meek and this team uh, that's assembled here. Um, for continuing to provide comprehensive and coordinated uh, approach to how we manage uh, COVID in this pandemic. Um, as Dr. Griggs just stated, we continue to be encouraged uh, by, by the numbers we're seeing regarding COVID-19 uh, in McClendon County. Um, our hospitalization rate has been significantly lower. Um, for the last two weeks, we've been at 10 or less hospitalized COVID patients. Our critical care um, uh, volume of patients has dropped off drastically over the last month. And, um, and we are sitting at uh, two or three um, patients in ICU with a COVID diagnosis over that time frame. So, so those are very encouraging uh, pieces of information. Um, to date, Ascension Providence has provided 65,949 vaccines. Um, and again, to Dr. Griggs' point, um, uh, vaccinations are critical um, in our management of this pandemic. Um, we will continue to co uh, collaborate closely uh, with local and state health officials to ensure that we're doing everything that we can um, to get vaccine um, in, in patients who are desiring that vaccine. Um, it is an important step, step to help prevent the spread uh, of this serious disease and to protect loved ones um, uh, around you. Um, so I would encourage folks to, to continue to seek out those vaccines, um, either through um, uh, the public health source or through their, uh, their primary care provider. Um, I think it is, it is vitally important for us to continue to see a decline in numbers in our community. 
Um, we at Ascension Providence do continue to have restrictions on visitors in our facility. Um, on April 12th, uh, we updated our visitor policy uh, to allow two visitors um, for our, our non-COVID patients. Our COVID patients are a little more restricted in that they can have uh, one visitor for a limited time period each day. Uh, and we encourage folks to, to call and schedule uh, a time for that appointment so that we can better coordinate um, that visit. Um, there was a question uh, that was raised uh, yesterday. CDC updated uh, some guidelines around, around what can vaccinated uh, individuals uh, do in, in, a, um, in a public setting, an outdoor setting. Um, and that, that um, I, I would encourage you to, to, to read the full update. Um, essentially, uh, what they said is fully vaccinated uh, individuals no longer need to wear a mask um, outdoors, except in certain crowded settings and venues. And that's a, that's a pretty broad statement. As you get further into uh, the update itself, uh, it, does, it does spell out a little more specifically. Uh, the higher the incidence in the community, certainly the greater the risk. Um, and as Dr. Griggs pointed out, um, our incidence is pretty low in our community at the present time. Um, so, so there is some validity to this statement. Um, so at the present time, um, we would be considered a, a low uh, prevalence community. We have about a third, a little more than a third of our community vaccinated. Um, so recognize that two thirds of people, um, if you just take the law of averages in that large gathering, uh, may not be vaccinated. So, so there is some risk. Um, the more people we can get vaccinated, the more safety there is uh, in that environment. So again, a reason for all of us to consider vaccines as, as a public health uh, responsibility that we have. The length of the visit, so, so the longer I'm in a crowd, uh, the more risk there is for exposure. So shorter visits are better. Um, and then uh, a place where I can't really maintain physical distance from another um, may be a higher risk um, environment. And then um, last, they, they went on to spell out in, in their update um, activities that may be more uh, risky. And the ones they particularly called out are, are activities where they're singing, shouting, physical exertion, heavy breathing. Um, and then um, they went on to say where you're really in tight quarters or, or, um, or there's an inability to wear a mask if you are in a tight quarter. So, so while they did update and they did provide some leeway to, to individuals who have been vaccinated for outdoor activities, um, again, I, I would encourage folks to use common sense. Um, it, it is still a reasonable uh, thing to wear a mask. Um, I, I, would, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, I still think it's prudent, um, but, but do recognize that CDC did update that guideline. And for more information, I would refer you to, to the CDC website uh, to get more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Becker. We appreciate your report. Uh, we'll now turn it to Dr. Ma for his report. Thank you, Mayor Meek. Um, we appreciate your leadership during this tough times for last one year, um, and especially in the last six months since I joined, I have seen significant uh, collaboration between all the leaders and healthcare facilities and I've worked closely with Dr. Griggs and Dr. Becker, and we have uh, been able to serve the community together. So we appreciate everybody, including Judge Felton, who has kept us uh, appraised of all the legal aspects and uh, the data that we needed to know to, to deliver our care. Our news is similar to the news Dr. Briggs and Dr. Becker shared. Um, numbers have been low. Uh, morale has been good. Team has been in positive spirits. Um, we also have loosened some uh, visitation policy recently, um, but at the same time, we are still cautious, just like other healthcare industry members have told you. In spite of the governor's orders, Baylor Scott and White is still standing behind masking within the facility indoors. So we are supportive of masking. Um, hand hygiene, without a shadow of a doubt, has been historically 200 years old proven record that it reduces the infection, whether it's coronavirus or whether it's C. diff. So we continue encouraging that. And this has led us to uh, all time low flu season. So this hand hygiene, masking, social distancing, even it loosens, you need to be careful moving forward. 
um, and use your judgment as Dr. Becker said, read the articles carefully. Um, vaccination, uh, as far as vaccination is concerned, uh, we have started providing vaccination to our patients. Uh, we have through our my charts and through our web pages, some portals available, um, but we have seen the demand dropping in the recent past. Um, we have more availability than the community is seeking vaccination. We encourage uh, community members to please uh, reach out to your primary care doctors and all the uh, on, and your and your friends uh, so that you can get vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, moving forward, um, one of the questions which was raised was the variants. Somebody was concerned about the different kind of variants that we are seeing, and how vaccinations will um, help or may not help. So, as per the CDC, there are a handful of variants which are out there and they will continue to increase. The more we do genetic st study, the more we go out into the months and years, the variants are just gonna keep on increasing. What happens when variants come through, they may increase the virulence of the virus or the way the virus behaved, or they may decrease it. Um, as per CDC, um, the good news is that 60% of the variant that we are seeing is the UK variant and state of Texas of all the variants. And though there is some association of increased transmission and death, um, we do not know the exact amount, but vaccination has some protection. Um, it is clearly said in multiple medical journals, the vaccination, no matter what variant comes, has some aspect of prevention, whether it's uh, ranging from lowest to the highest, but vaccination will help those variants also. The second most prevalent variant is the California variant, which um, does increase um, some transmission. That's 6% of the total variant that we are seeing in Texas. And they are also somewhat affected by the vaccines. Um, they are 20% uh, more transmissible. However, uh, they are somewhat two to three times less effective with vaccines. And the third variant, which is um, more prevalent than 2%, and everything else is lumped into others, is the South African. That has shown um, to be the least effective to the vaccination. But the good news is in the whole state of Texas, we are seeing only 2% out of all the variants uh, is the South African variant. So we, the, the message that I would like to send to the community is variants are gonna be there and the, the message will continue changing, but please get vaccinated there is some immunity, antibodies are gonna protect those variants and they do help in some shape and form, if not 100%. There is no 100% vaccination um, for COVID available, but 90% above means that there's a 10% chance that you may get sick with COVID, but still the severity of the disease should not be that heavily if you were not vaccinated. So I encourage everybody to get vaccinated and I'll happy to take any questions, if any. Thank you, Dr. Maud. I'll give a brief report from my side of things. Um, thanks for the update from everyone. And I'm pleased to hear today's data, including the status of vaccinations in our community. I myself am signed up for the vaccine and have an appointment this week. Unlike some of our more senior statesmen on this call, uh, given my age and my risk category, it was important uh, for me that the most vulnerable were vaccinated first. And now that our wait list has been depleted, uh, I look forward to being vaccinated myself. It's encouraging to hear the many ways in which our metrics continue to improve, but along with everyone else on this call, I join in on asking the community to, rem to remember that while things continue to look better, we have not made it out of this pandemic yet. There are many ways in which we can be optimistic and yet practice good public health practices and precautions to protect ourselves and those around us. As of this Tuesday, uh, April 27th, 195,076 tests have been reported in McLennan County. Free COVID-19 testing continues to be offered in our, uh, in our community at the McLennan Community College drive through Clinic. 2,116 tests were administered in March at our free testing locations. And as of last week, 1,162 tests have been administered in our free testing location in April. Over the last month, our weekly testing average is 355 tests per week. Please visit covidwaco.com 
to confirm available testing locations and to register for a test if you think you need one. This is a free resource available to you if you need it. Finally, given our improving numbers and community COVID-19 status, I'm glad, I'm glad to announce that today is the last scheduled COVID-19 press conference. This marks a significant improvement in the COVID-19 situation locally. As we continue forward into recovery, COVID-19 will remain our centralized resource uh, for local COVID-19 information. At covidwaco.com, you can find information on the vaccine distribution, testing centers, community dashboards and data, the weekly health district status report, and many other COVID-19 resources. Again, covidwaco.com will continue to have updated data. If you do not have access to the internet, you can call 254-750 one eight nine zero, not only for vaccines, but to speak to someone about COVID-19 questions or concerns. Of course, if the situation changes locally and we see a return to indicators such as COVID-19 related hospital capacity concerns, this group and this press conference can be re reconvened to keep the public informed. I'd like to close my comments by saying thank you to everyone who dedicated time and energy to bringing these updates to our community. Judge Felton, Dr. Griggs, Dr. Becker, and Dr. Ahmad, and the many other physicians who have joined us on behalf of Ascension Providence and Baylor Scott and White over the last year. City staff who have helped host and facilitate, including, including Larry Holsey and Kelly Crane, and of course, former Mayor Deaver who began these press conferences over a year ago. During this pandemic, we have worked hard to collaborate with our community stakeholders around a strategic response and ensure the public is completely informed. And we will continue to do this. Thank you to Dr. Werner, LaShonda Mowry Horn, Deidre Emerson, and the entire health district team who have served tirelessly throughout this pandemic. And last, my thanks to the Waco community who have rallied together to support each other in an incredibly difficult, sometimes confusing and certainly challenging year. To those healthcare providers, cities, uh, city and county staff members, teachers, and other frontline workers who have sacrificed, thank you. To those who have endured pain, to those who have suffered in a hospital, to those who have lost loved ones, our hearts go to you and my prayers are still for you. The Waco way is to show love and support, graciousness and decency, compassion and care in times like this. And I've seen that over and over again this last year. And as we move into a new phase, I know this identity will be unshaken. We've had discussions about doing a citywide memorial service for those lost and to honor those who have served. Um, more details on this will be forthcoming in the days ahead. As I and others on this call have said, we are not out of the woods yet, but I'm confident that day is coming soon. Thank you for your time and we'll continue to take questions now. I'll turn it over to Ashley Nystrom with the City of Waco who will be fielding the questions. Thank you, Mayor. We do have um, two media representatives on the call today. We have Rihanna Sager with the Waco Tribune Herald and Robin Geske with uh, KWTX News 10. Um, Rhiannon, I've uh, allowed you to talk. If you want to ask, go ahead and ask your first question. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, my next question is, what kind of timeline might we see for the final diminishing of COVID cases? I mean, is there anything that we can predict right now or is that just as up in the air as everything has been in this pandemic? It's <laughs> a great question, Rihanna. Uh, Dr. Griggs, do you want to take a stab at, at that? You know, Ryan, there are a lot of variables that are unknown. One being, what's the current rate of nat natural immunity? I mean, how many people have actually been infected? We know the cases um, that, that have been diagnosed but we also know that there's a lot of asymptomatic disease that's been spread and we don't know the total population that has had the infection and so have some immunity to uh, the virus. So that's a big unknown. Um, we also 
can't predict the community's behaviors in terms of vaccination uptake. You know, I, uh, I want to see as close to 100% vaccination as possible so that we can um, create, at least locally, uh, something that approximates herd immunity. Um, I, I, um, I worry uh, about those who, for non-scientific reasons, are ideologically um, against uh, being vaccinated. Um, I think that, that there's this, there's a really important group of people who just don't quite feel ready yet or just still have some questions. And uh, to, to that population, um, I, I totally get it. Um, I mean, science is confusing and can be really challenging to understand. Um, but that's why you have uh, a, a, a primary care clinician, a guide who can answer your questions and help you sort out a decision that, is, um, that appreciates your own individual values and can uh, and can help you sort through um, your own concerns and what the benefit versus the risk might be to any given individual. So just I would just encourage um, uh, those who are kind of feeling that ambivalence uh, around the vaccine to to seek out um, uh, counsel from your primary care clinician. Got, I got a little on a tangent there uh, on vaccinations. See where my headspace is, uh, Rhiannon. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Griggs. All right, Robin, I've brought you over if you want to go ahead and ask your first question. Sure, actually, that's probably going to be the only one that I, I um, ask because the second one, um, Mary, sorry, answered, but um, like it seems like a lot of the interest and like the excitement around, you know, getting vaccinated has kind of waned over the last couple of weeks nationwide and, and especially here locally as well. Um, what are you guys kind of doing to like reinvigorate the um, interest in getting vaccinated? Because it seems like, you know, very, very little of the population is actually fully vaccinated. Sure. Um, I will uh, give this to uh, our health district director, Lashana Mallory Horn, um, who, along with her team, is working around the clock um, to reinvigorate that interest. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robin, for that question. So we're working really hard at trying to establish and create an education campaign around vaccine safety. Our vaccine ambassador program that the judge spoke of earlier is a part of this effort. We have about 20 trained ambassadors right now that are able to, to answer commonly asked questions about COVID-19. And we're also looking at ways to expand the footprint of this into more of a layperson or a promotor educator model. We will build capacity in levels um, that are a little in community that's a little less um, formal. So we want to try to work with like local barbers and hairstylists to make sure they understand how safe the vaccine is so they can pass this message on. Um, getting some of our Spanish speaking community involved to make sure we're able to, to um, relay this message to our Latinx population that's Spanish speaking and also working really closely with um, the school districts, especially as we get closer to the start of school again in the fall to make sure all those over the age of 16 are offered vaccine as a part of the back to school vaccine push that typically happens every year with the TVFC or the Texas Vaccine for Children program every year. So it's a lot of education being done. We have a wonderful community health education supervisor and Ashley Williams, who's done a dynamic job of putting together the vaccine ambassador program. She understands public and community health education, and I look forward to seeing this move forward. Thank you. Thank you, LaShonda. Thank you, LaShonda. Uh, Rihanna, did you have another question to add? Yes, uh, it kind of relates to that last question, but is there any indication that somebody not having insurance makes them less likely to get the vaccine. Of course, the vaccine is free and available to the public, but uh, if you don't have an insurance, you may not have a regular doctor, you might not have a doctor that you can go to for questions, et cetera. Does that play a role? Lashana, do you have any thoughts on that? I definitely think that if you don't regularly access the healthcare system, you're less likely to try to access this you know, vaccine opportunities. So that's a part of the education campaign, making sure that everyone in the community knows that there's no charge for COVID-19 vaccine. And that's regardless if you get it from us in one of our community-based clinics or at the convention center from Dr. Grid's office, either the hospital uh, provider, opportunities, there's no cost for COVID-19 vaccine. And that's been across the country and across the state. So that, that needs to be communicated. 
I don't know for sure if we have, we don't have hard data that says that's why people aren't accessing vaccine, but based on the data that shows us our populations that are getting vaccinated, we can say that there are less, those that are not are more likely to be uninsured or underinsured than those that are getting vaccinated, just based on how people access healthcare in general. So I think that there's some correlation, but we don't have any hard data that shows that, it, that there is, we'll definitely do some education around that. Thank you, LaShonda. And Mayor, we'll, uh, we'll leave that there. Robin, unless you have another question, um, we'll turn it back over to the mayor for a closing comment. No, thank you, I'm good. Thanks, Robin. Uh, thanks everyone again for being on this call. As a reminder, there will be a Spanish replay at 4.30, an English replay at 7 p.m. And both are available at covidwaco.com resources pages. Please continue to visit covidwaco.com for the latest information about vaccines and COVID-19 response in Waco and McLennan County. Thanks for joining us today. Be safe, get your COVID-19 vaccine, and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.